So now that we've established the idea of a very complex body structure associated with the multicellularity that fungi possess, we also looked at one of the most complex body structures previously known as the mycorrhizal fungi and the mycorrhizae relationship. We can now get into something that I alluded to before when we mentioned the body structure, which is reproduction and reproductive structures. But more specifically now, we're actually going to be looking at how that structure associates with the function of reproduction itself in the next two flowcharts. So we'll entitle this next flowchart Reproduction 1. And this is going to be devoted to how fungi are able to reproduce because, again, the goal of life is survival. And we've seen survival in fungi. Their capabilities of absorption are very good for survival. And now we're going to see the other side of life, which is reproduction. So let's look at reproduction. And we're going to subtitle this first flowchart to reproduction as spores. We alluded to spores previously. Now we'll get into the details. Spores are essentially the haploid structures of reproduction. They are haploid and thus they are only n. If you remember from genetics, diploid would be 2n, haploid means n, that they have half the genetic information essentially. So that's what we mean by the spores. They're haploid uh, little structures, okay? Now, in terms of their production, they are produced uh, one of two ways. So we'll say produced either uh, at the tip of hyphae, and this is something we've already mentioned when we looked at the structure of reproduction. Um, this is going to essentially be those aerial hyphae that I was referring to. So if they're produced at the tip of hyphae, they're produced on the aerial hyphae, or they can be produced um, in the fruiting body. And if we remember, the fruiting body is simply that large mushroom structure, that, that characteristic structure that most um, people associate with fungi. So fruiting body or at the tip of hyphae is where, uh, are where spores can be produced. Now, in terms of how they're produced, they can be produced also uh, one of two ways. They can be produced either um, sexually or, and that's interesting here, or asexually, as if there's a choice, as if there's a capability of doing one or the other. And we're going to get into how that specifically happens um, a little bit later. So keep in mind that it's not uh, all entirely sexual reproduction. It's not all entirely asexual reproduction like uh, we saw in protists, a lot like how we saw in uh, the bacteria, prokaryotes. We actually have a bit of the sexual reproduction as well, and we're going to get into that a little bit later. Now, spores, uh, an important caveat to note about these spores is that they are not not motile. They're not motile. Motile, motility, refers to the ability to move on its own at least. And if we think of the classic motile reproductive uh, cell, we think of a sperm cell. A sperm cell has this capability of moving because it has a flagella. It has this uh, flagella that is powered by the several mitochondria within the entire sperm cell structure that allow for that whip-like motion. And it's a very, very complex, uh, very, very evolutionary conserved structure that's successful. But spores are not like that. Spores have no flagella. And because they have no flagella, they certainly cannot move on their own. They have to have some sort of help. And the key idea here to understand is that they must be dispersed. They need help in terms of moving from the fungi at which they're produced to a separate area at which they can somehow um, undergo some sort of growth process afterwards. Okay, Some sort of germination is the correct word here, and we'll get into that. So how can they be dispersed? Oftentimes, they can be dispersed by the wind. Where would you probably see that? Probably over here at the tip of the hyphae. When we talk about aerial hyphae, the wind just hits the spores and the spores fly away with the wind. There also can be dispersal through water because there are some fungi that are closely associated with water environments and also uh, animals. Animals can be good forms of dispersal mechanisms. Animals brush by fungi, they carry some spores with them and the spores themselves will uh, move with the animals essentially. All of these things are here for a reason. All of these forms of dispersal provide a transport mechanism. That's the key here. Provide transport mechanism. Why do we need to provide this? That's because they are not motile. They can't do it themselves. They need air. They need to push by water or they need to be latched onto an animal, let's say, and then um, be dispersed through that process. They can't do it on their own. So now, last thing to note about spores, 
is the following. Um, they have to land, essentially, because they're moving somewhere. They need to land in a moist environment with food. They need, need to land in moist environment. So it doesn't just mean that these fungi are going to grow wherever they land. They actually have to have spe specifications. Land in moist environment with food. And this makes sense, right? Don't we usually expect, as I mentioned before, fungi to be found in moist environments, environments that have some sort of food that can be absorbed through that hydrolytic enzyme process of absorption? That makes sense, and that's exactly what needs to be, happen. And if this happens, if this little tiny spore, this haploid spore, lands in a moist environment with food, it will germinate. And germinate simply means it'll start growing, it'll start developing, it'll start doing uh, fungi-like things in terms of its growth and development. And then finally, it will produce a new mycelium. Produce new, that's the key word here, mycelium. And mycelium, if we remember, are those uh, extended forms of hyphae that allow for absorption. And if you have these new mycelium forming, you have the capability of absorbing. Thus, you have the capability of surviving and getting food and being heterotrophic, all of those things that we've mentioned before. So this is a very, very simplified version of fungi development that we'll expand upon um, in the next video in terms of reproduction. This is just a basic overview of fungi reproduction to give us some facts. Now, I want to leave you with one important fact about fungi. Fungi. fungi are so good at dispersal. You might think that this might put them at a disadvantage, the fact that they can't do this on their own, that they need wind, water, or animals, but they're so good at dispersal. Next time, if you just imagine the scenario, if you leave, let's say, something that's a food, like a, a piece of a, of a fruit, a melon or something, on a table, and you come back one week later, what do you expect to happen to that melon? That melon is going to be full of these fuzzy fungi, right? Of this mold. That's what spore that's because spores are all throughout the air that's present in the world today. Spores are so good at spreading themselves throughout the air. They're with around you right now. They're around you all the time. They're so successful. They're so microscopic. You can't really see it. Um, just to give you an idea that that's spores. That's spores dispersal. The fact that when you leave something out um, of the fridge, let's say, and you put it into an environment that has spores around it, the spores will successfully germinate, successfully produce new mycelium, those extensions, and you'll have that fuzzy looking growth on the food. And that's something that we don't prefer. And thus we try to keep fresh fruit, something like that, away from uh, any sort of outside environment. That's just to give you some relevancy to the effect of spores, and we'll continue our discussion on reproduction in the next video.